Okay. Um, welcome back. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce Tim. Tim will be your Langdell for this abbreviated semester. Uh, he was in my class in the fall, right? Yes, sir. Uh, he got an A in my class, uh, and I think he will uh, be very helpful to you. Um, hey there. Uh, your first Langdell session will be... June 8th is my understanding. Okay, your first Langdell is on June 8th, and it's at what, 3 o'clock? Yeah, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Okay. Um, I have a class from 10 to 2, so that's why we had to kind of put it there. Um, once June is done and over with, if we want to talk about a different time to meet, that's fine, because my class will be over by then. Um, or if you guys want to change it, because I had initially a uh, proposed meeting in the morning, but that would mean getting up here at 8 on Saturday. I think 3 is better. Yeah. So that's, that's what we kind of decided on, 3 to 4. Um, also, I have my email address up there. It's timothy.bowman, B-O-M-A-N, at stcl.edu. Feel free to email me if you have questions or concerns or things like that. Okay, very good. Um, on the... Uh, syllabus on the date of um, that's the wrong screen. On I think it's what did I tell you, Tim. The twentieth. Okay, so on uh, June twentieth, uh, we're not going to have a regular class, but what I'm going to do is have Tim at Proctor uh, a midterm. It won't count. It's not going to count to grade at all. But I want to Proctor a midterm on the twentieth in class. You'll come here regular time and you'll take it. And then the following Saturday, that's the 22nd, uh, Tim will then go over it. And then you can meet with me one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, as we can find time to do it. Uh, but that's, that's going to be the, the framework. I can't give a full-blown midterm with a short semester, but at least you can uh, practice one, at least in class, for a little bit. And we can talk at the Langdell sessions. If you guys want to run another practice midterm, we can always yeah. do that. And, and just I'll, I'll give some, 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 some a general overview now. Uh, the exam is completely open book. It will not help you. Uh, <laughs> it, it will not help you. Whatever you bring will not help you at all. Uh, so take whatever notes you want, whatever outlines, whatever. It will not help you. Uh, and that's all I'll say about for now. OK? Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk more about what I did to prepare for his exam and what I took in uh, during the first Langdo session. So I kind of go over tips and tricks and things like that that I used to survive through Professor Blackman's class. He did better than survive. <laughs> he's also a he's also a high school teacher, so he's quite good at teaching. So I think he'll he'll work well. Anyway, thanks, Tim. A Thank you, any questions for Tim? Yeah. Okay. And like I said, feel free to email me, and I will see you guys on Saturday the eighth. Okay. Very good. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. You have a good evening. Um, I've started the attendance on the on the uh, reef. Uh, I see that five of you have checked in. There are five of you here. Why not? One, two, three, four. Oh, six, six. Okay. I can't count. Okay. So there's one more. Um, I'll have this running at the start of every class, and I'll usually turn it off right around when class starts. Uh, in this class like this, it's not that big of a deal, but uh, please uh, uh, do uh, check in. And I'll wait till, I'll wait till she's, uh, uh, she's in before I turn it off, because I can see one person still trying. OK, uh, generally at the start of class, what I will do is I'll post a, um, a question. Um, it might be true or false, might be A, B, C, D, F, G. Uh, uh, but it'll be a simple question to get you all thinking about the topic. Okay, Fabian, you in there yet? Yes. Okay, you, have you checked in for the attendance? Um, yes. Not checked in. Okay, you have to, you have to check in. So you're, it says you're not checked in. Okay, you're good. Okay. All right, very good. So now I'm going to start a poll. Okay, so the first question that I want to pose to you to get you guys thinking about the topic is, is this, is it true or false? And it's uh, right there. So the question is this. Um, the Constitution binds the president, I shall tweet the language, to follow, even better, to follow uh, the decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court. True or false? I usually give you about 30 seconds to think about the answer. Okay, everyone put your answers in, please. And these don't count for anything. I'm not going to penalize you. There's, no, there's actually, um, 
what, what, the reason why people hate this question usually is there's not always a right or wrong answer. These are sort of open-ended questions to get you to think. Uh, so I'm just going to go up and down the rows uh, to make it really easy for me. Sarash, what do you think? So I love it's true, but I feel like it depends on the situation. OK. What, what would it depend on? It depends on, well, for instance, um, in the case of Hillary Lincoln, uh, he was given certain powers, specifically were in a civil war during the rebellion. And, certain, uh, and when he technically, when he declared the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, 18. or 1863, sorry, uh, he was um, technically in violation of Dred Scott's case at the Supreme Court. But nobody seemed to really mind when he did that. We will talk at great length about the Emancipation later this semester. Uh, but let me just take a step back, Sarash. You said he was given these new powers during the war. Mm -hmm. um, where does the president get his powers from? Uh, I believe it's Article 3. Okay, does the Constitution you know, get bigger in a time of war? Does, like, are there pages added to this book? No, it's, I feel like it's more the interpretation of what the powers are, uh, depending on the situation. And I mean, I know since uh, President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the presidential powers have expanded further and, further and further. But has the Constitution actually changed? No. Okay. All right. So, Lynch, what do you think? Does the, does the Constitution? You notice I didn't ask, do, does an interpretation bind him? I said true, but now I'm thinking false because it's, it's not the Constitution that binds the president. Mm hmm. Let's see what people put. Okay, pretty. I mean, it's only five pieces. So I, can I can actually process elimination. There's, there's, there's <laughs> two and three. You revised? Or I have to renew it. It's oh, you didn't vote. Yeah, so I can't vote. But I, if you, a lot of it it's a poll tax. You have to pay to vote. Oh, God, this is <laughs> awful. No, I'm sorry. I know. It sucks you have to pay. I'm sorry. Uh, just add one more vote. Okay, well, so then, then, we're, then we're split in half. Yeah. All right, so I think the answer here, at least I think, um, is false. Um, perhaps under how we often view government, uh, we see the Supreme Court as like a Supreme Court. Um, and everyone has to do whatever they say. And as a modern matter, um, that's pretty accurate. Uh, but if you actually look at the Constitution itself, uh, it mentions the Supreme Court. It says they have a judicial power. And the Constitution also mentions the president, who has executive powers. And it mentions Congress, who has legislative powers. But it doesn't say any one branch is supreme. And it doesn't say that one branch gets to tell the other branch what to do. Um, as a practical matter, presidents from Washington to the present have listened and not ignored Supreme Court orders, with maybe a few exceptions, perhaps. But they've generally gone along. But that doesn't have to happen. And our very first case today, um, a famous case that every law student has to know, is Marbury versus Madison. And in that case, it almost came to be that the president may not have followed what the Supreme Court said. Um, so let me take a step back, give you some background. Again, I, I presume you know nothing about American history, which is fine. You don't have to. Uh, but I'll give you a little bit of background here. After the Constitution was ratified in 1789, the first president, I'm sure everyone knows this much, is George Washington. And he was a very popular general who ran basically unopposed. Washington ran for re-election once. And he was reelected by a very wide margin, not quite unanimous, but a very wide margin. But things got dicey after Washington decided to step down. He did not run for a third term. And then we had the presidential election of 1796. The president was John Adams. The vice president was Thomas Jefferson. They hated each other. And you can imagine, right? Imagine this were like, you know, 
you have President Donald Trump and Vice President Hillary Clinton, right, with a runner-up as a VP. Just, just think about that for like a second. That'd be really bad, right? No one would want that in the world. <laughs> um, but that's how it was. You had these adversaries, these opponents who were of different political parties in the same office. So you had Adams was a member of the Federalist Party, and yet Jefferson was a member of the Republican Party. Well, we call it today the Republican Party, but it was called the Republican Democrats, Democratic Republicans, the different name, but we'll just call them Republicans because it's easier. Um, then we have another election in 1800. And the election of 1800 was a disaster. Um, there were three uh, major candidates, right? There was Adams, who was a sitting president. There was Jefferson, who was the vice president, and a person named Aaron Burr. Um, Adams lost, right? There was no question Adams was a loser. And he got the hell out of town, right? He did not want to deal with it. But there was a tie in the Electoral College. Jefferson and Aaron Burr had the same number of votes. Um, not total votes, but votes in the Electoral College. And under our Constitution, when there's a tie in the Electoral College, the House representatives votes to resolve the, to resolve the dispute. At the time, the House was controlled by the Federalist Party. That was Adams' party. And they had to make a choice, right? Who do we hate less, Jefferson or Burr? And after 36 rounds of voting, they finally broke the tie and picked Jefferson as president. So uh, Thomas Jefferson became the president. Um, but the Federalist Party recognized that they were in trouble, right? They lost their house. Of, they lost their votes in Congress. They lost their uh, the, the presidency. They were on their way out of town. And indeed, the Federalist Party would never again have any sort of political power. The party would just die. So what happened? In the final days before the Jefferson inauguration, the Federalist Party enacted some laws. They did things to try to solidify their power in ways that Jefferson could not undo. And one of the most famous bills they passed was called the Judiciary Act. Okay, The Judiciary Act of 1801. They passed this in 1801 before the inauguration. Okay, what did the Judiciary Act do? It created new judges. The thinking was, if we won't have control in the Congress, well, we'll put our own judges in. This was often called the Midnight Judges Bill, right? Because it was passed the very last, you know, the last days of the administration. Um, during this time, John Adams had a person in his cabinet by the name of John Marshall, a very famous person. And John Marshall was serving as the Secretary of State. John Marshall then nominated, I'm sorry, John Adams then nominated John Marshall to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So Marshall, who was a very bright guy, was simultaneously serving as both the Secretary of State and the Chief Justice at the same time. At the time, the Supreme Court was a pretty boring job. It wasn't that much work. But again, Marshall was a giant. He, 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 it's hard to describe how accomplished he was. Um, towards the end, right before the inauguration, um, Adams nominated a bunch of federal judges. Um, and the process went like this. The president would make the nomination. The Senate then votes, right? At that point, once the Senate votes, the person is, 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 is uh, basically confirmed. The president then uh, puts the seal, which is basically this piece of wax, on this piece of paper, which is called a commission, right? This is the, the, the document saying you have the job. The president signs it, puts a seal on it. You know, remember the expression, sign, seal, delivered, right? It's like this, right? So you sign it, you seal it, and then they didn't deliver. Okay, why did they not deliver? They ran out of time. Um, Adams basically, on the night before the inauguration, signed these things and went to sleep. Then he got the hell out of town like at four in the morning. He did not want to see Jefferson. He, he, he skipped bail. He skipped town. He got the hell out. 
It then fell to John Marshall, who was the Secretary of State and the Chief Justice, to deliver the commissions. He delivered some of them, but not all of them. And he was unable to deliver the commission to one William Marbury on time. He just didn't get it there in time, right? Marbury got appointed, he sent it approved, John Adams signed his commission, but Marbury never got his damn piece of paper. Then Jefferson's inaugurated, and Jefferson tells his new Secretary of State, James Madison, don't deliver those commissions. Don't deliver them. Throw them away. Get rid of them. I don't want those federal judges to be anywhere near our government. And indeed, Jefferson did more than that. The Republicans basically abolished a lot of these new judges. Wait, a Josh, the judges had lifetime tenure. Yeah, they kind of sort of pushed them aside. Complicated case, but a lot of these judges no longer had a job. What about poor William Marbury, right? He never got his commission. So he decided to go to court. Okay. Um, but he did something very specific. Right? So, Lindsay, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, you with this one? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, usually, you learn this in CIF Pro, right? If I want to sue someone, what court do I usually start in? Where do I usually start a case? What kind of court? A trial court. A trial court, right? Usually when you have a dispute between X and Y, you start off in a trial court, right? But Marbury didn't start that way. What, what did Marbury do? He went straight to the Supreme Court. He went straight to the US Supreme Court. Now, that's, that's, that's pretty bold, right? I mean, you could start anywhere. But he had a specific goal in mind, right? He recognized that the lower courts were now going to be uh, less receptive to claims, and he was hoping that the federal Supreme Court would give him a little bit more uh, help. Um, so the question then becomes this, right? Could the Supreme Court help him? Right? Could the Supreme Court actually help him? Um, this case is long, and it's complicated, and it's backwards. Why is it backwards? Right, Lindsay, what's the first question any court has to ask itself before they can go forward? What's the first thing a court needs to, to begin any sort of decision? Do they have jurisdiction? Right, do they have jurisdiction, right? First, first, if you ever write a brief, the very first section, is there jurisdiction? Because if there's not jurisdiction, case is dismissed, right? C courts can't pursue without jurisdiction. Marshall writes the opinion Backwards. And I'll summarize it first before we go into the weeds. Right? The very first question is, does this court have jurisdiction to act? If the answer is yes, we go ahead. If the answer is no, dismiss the case. Marshall doesn't talk about jurisdiction until the very end. Um, this opinion could have been about a paragraph long. Court lacks jurisdiction, dismissed. Done. Oh, one, one other part. Chief Justice Marshall recused. Let me focus on that for a minute, right? Why was Marshall even involved in this case? It was his fault. It was his fault that Marbury didn't get the damn commission in time. He doesn't mention this. He sort of says like something like, the commission was not delivered. Well, yeah, no shit, Sherlock, right? <laughs> it's your fault, right? I mean, that, that's got to take some, some you know, gall to say, oh, yeah, it wasn't delivered. It was him. It was him, right? He, he, he didn't do that. But the first question is, was there jurisdiction? Now, why did Marshall write the opinion like this? And this is where I think uh, politics comes into play in a little bit. Not entirely, but comes into play. I go back and forth whether Marbury is correctly decided. Sometimes I think yes, sometimes I think no. I, I go back and forth. I think they're, I go back and forth. Um, but at the most basic level, Marshall recognized a point. If he ruled against President Jefferson, and he told President Jefferson, give Marbury this, the commission. Would Jefferson have followed it? 
I like to say no. Maybe yes. I don't know. Jefferson was a bit of a pushover with these things. He actually he agreed to more stuff with Mar with uh, Marshall than than you'd like to agree to. Um, but the conventional wisdom is Marshall would not have. I'm sorry. Jefferson would not have gotten along with it, and then Jefferson would have ignored the ruling, which then raises a, a very important question, right? What happens when a court says, go do something, and the president says, bye-bye, right? What does that do to the court then? Lindsay, I'm sorry, Chelsea, what does that do to the court then when, the, when a court says, go do something, and the, and the, and the president says, sorry, I'm not going to do it? Yeah, it makes court look weak, powerless. I like that word, right? And if the president ignores the court, then what happens to everyone else? Yeah, and then you know how it goes from there. Um, so Jefferson was in a weird spot where had he actually issued a ruling ordering Jefferson to give the commission over and then Jefferson ignored the ruling, um, it could have weakened the court. And this was a young court in 1803. The Supreme Court didn't really have that much respect. It was a pretty insignificant body. So Jefferson tried doing something a little funky. I'm sorry, Marshall. Marshall tried doing something a little funky. Here's what he did. He said, we're going to do this entire judicial review thing. Right, we'll get there. But in the end, we'll say, but we don't have jurisdiction, so you don't have to deliver the commission, which is backwards. If there's no jurisdiction, then why are you talking about if the statute is constitutional? In other words, if the court lacks subject matter jurisdiction, right, SMJ, right, then what are you doing? Why are you wasting all of your poor students' time reading this decision where for 200 years lawyers have read this stupid opinion over and over again when there's no jurisdiction? Again, so I think the correct decision been one paragraph, dismissed for lack of jurisdiction, Marshall the Chief Justice recused, and then, then we just go home. Uh, I think we're in a very different world if we had that decision. Maybe not. Who knows? OK. All right, so let's walk through this one step at a time. Um, the first question, right? The first question is, does Marv have a right to the commission? And this one is actually pretty easy. Um, Marshall says that all of the steps necessary to make an appointment were done. Right? Look at the Constitution. The president, was nom uh, the president nominated Marbury, right? The Senate gave its advice and consent. And the president signed the commission. All the steps were done. Um, the fact that Marshall failed to deliver it doesn't really matter, right? The it was done. All the steps needed were done. And he has one hypothetical I always find uh, a persuasive. Uh, imagine you know, the president signed the commission and you were trying to deliver it. And then you know the, the, the wagon fell over into a river or something. And then the river washed away the commission and it was destroyed. Would any of you think the person's not a judge now? No, you just get another one. Right? Or imagine there's a fire and the thing burns. Do you, do you lose your judgeship if the thing burns? No. Right? So the actual delivery of the, of the, of the piece of paper was like inconsequential. The final act, the signing of the commission, once that was done, it was good. President nominated it. Senate confirmed, President signed the thing, his idiot secretary failed to deliver, that's not his fault. Um, so that, that much is, I think, easy. But the second issue is, do the laws afford him a remedy? Right, so Audrey, what are the laws that Marshall, or actually Marbury, I should say, relied on to get his commission? Um, I guess you were saying that he, I guess, like, interfered with the legally performing his duty. Mm. So I guess the interference. Well, what exactly, what remedy was Marshall, I'm sorry, I keep saying Marshall, what remedy was Marbury seeking in court? Oh, the, uh, in order to do something. What do you, what do you call that? No, not contempt. Injunction. Not injunction. A writ of mandamus. There it is. Okay. Mandamus. Mandamus. Very good. Mandamus. Um, 
Marbury went to the court and asked for rid of mandamus. And he cited the Judiciary Act of 1789, which I have up here for you. It's long. Section 13 of the Judiciary Act of 1789 says, the Supreme Court shall also have appellate jurisdiction from the circuit courts and courts of the several states and the cases herein after it's supposed to be provided for, semicolon, and shall have power to issue blah, 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 writs of mandamus in cases warranted by the principles and usage of blah, blah, blah. Okay. Marshall, Marbury goes, okay, look, Congress enacted a statute in 1789 which gives the Supreme Court jurisdiction, the power to issue writs of mandamus. What's a writ of mandamus? When a court issues an order to an officer to do X. In this case, to deliver the commission. What's the problem, right? The statute says, Supreme Court, you can give this, give this commission out. Mar Marbury says, okay, the laws say I get this commission, give me the damn commission. Tyler, what's the problem? What's the problem? What the Judiciary Act doesn't say, and that's the original jurisdiction. The literal language of the Constitution discusses it prior to appellate. The Judiciary Act, Section 13, begins talking about appellate and doesn't come back to what is original jurisdiction. Okay, so a couple things said there are very good. I want to tease them out, right? Does the statute say, and, and read it carefully after the semicolon, right? Does the statute say that the Supreme Court can issue a writ of mandamus in its original jurisdiction? It doesn't, right? It's talking about appellate jurisdiction, and then it says semicolon, and shall have power to issue writs of prohibition. So maybe the argument is, it says appellate here, therefore here refers to all kinds of jurisdiction. Um, I think the best reading of this statute, and I've written about this before, is that the court was talking only, I'm sorry, Congress was talking about appellate jurisdiction. Um, this was a statute passed by the very first Congress, 1789, James Madison, those guys, they were writing this statute. To think that the people who wrote the Constitution went and passed a facial and constitutional statute um, always strikes me as, as, a, as a very hard argument to swallow. But it's somewhat open. And Marbury says, look, it doesn't say only in appellate jurisdiction. It says the court shall have the power. And Marbury then goes and says, I am going to invoke the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction. Now, Constitution says you have original jurisdiction for cases involving ambassadors, public ministers, and consuls where state's a party. Uh, Marbury was not an ambassador. Uh, he was not a public minister. He's not a consul. It's basically a diplomat. State's not a party. So I think it's pretty clear that he can't bring this suit in the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction. I think that much I can. I, go, I can go along with. And if that's right, then just dismiss the case in one sentence. Why are you doing all this other stuff? Okay, But Marbury is read for a different reason. Okay, Now, how many of you learned in um, college or high school that, that John Marshall invented Jewish Review in Marbury? Did you learn that? It's all, it's all garbage. It's, it's bogus. This didn't happen. It's, it's like m one of the worst myths in all of education, which I, with every fiber of my being, tried to eradicate. It's not true. Um, the English courts have been declaring laws contrary to the English Constitution for, oh my God, a century? If I could even count it, maybe longer, depending how you count. Um, if you read Alexander Hamilton in Federal 78, which I gave you an excerpt of last class, he discusses uh, the, the judicial duty, right? to follow the higher law, that if you have a, a constitution and you have a statute and the constitution's here and the statute's here, you follow the higher of the two laws. Um, so Marshall didn't invent it. This is, sure, the first time the Supreme Court declared a federal law unconstitutional, right? But he didn't invent it. It's a myth. 
So here's the rub of how Marshall goes about his opinion. He says, the statute gives the Supreme Court the power to issue writs of mandamus in, in original jurisdiction. I don't think that's right, but we'll just assume it's for the moment. If, in fact, the statute did give the Supreme Court that jurisdiction, then it conflicts with Article 3, Section 2. In other words, here are the only times when the Supreme Court can have original jurisdiction, and that's it. It cannot be expanded. What Marshall concludes is that the Judiciary Act of 1789, Section 13, tried to expand the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction. It cannot do that. It cannot do that. That much is right. I don't think it tried to, but assuming it did, then Mar Marshall's correct. Okay? And because the Judiciary Act of 1789 is unconstitutional, then there's no jurisdiction. And because there's no jurisdiction, the case is dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. And because this case is dismissed for lack of jurisdiction, Barber gets nothing. And Madison has, doesn't have to do anything. In fact, James Madison, the guy who basically wrote much of the Constitution, who wrote the Judiciary Act, was the defendant in this case. And he didn't even make an argument. He didn't even show up to argue in the case. He didn't even show up. And he won. Right? He won. Because there's no actual order against Jefferson to do or not do anything. Okay? So the upshot again, I, I sort of spoiled the ending, is that Marshall holds that there's no there's no subject matter jurisdiction, that the statute which gave the court jurisdiction was unconstitutional, therefore there's no jurisdiction. And because there's no jurisdiction, the case is dismissed for want of jurisdiction. Okay. Questions on Marbury? Yes, Tyler. Question, sir. It's on it's on DC that I, I don't quite understand uh, the history of the JP position in Washington County, District of Columbia. But if that's a specifically federal, it is controlled yeah. area and position. Where should he have gone to file? Ah, okay. So he, here's the good question, right? So. Um, Adams appointed John Marshall as a Justice of the Peace, a JP, um, for the District of Columbia, uh, which was the federal district. Um, at the time, Alexandria, Virginia, which is right outside of the capital, was part of the federal district, what, what today is Alexandria. Um, where should he have sued? Uh, there was a circuit court, a trial court, basically, in the District of Columbia. And he could have sued there. He didn't. Uh, indeed, even after he lost this case, he never went back to the lower court to try and sue again. He gave up because he knew he wasn't going to win. Uh, one other bit which I forgot to mention, the uh, Republican Congress basically abolished the Supreme Court's term so they couldn't hear this case for one year. They said, you're not meeting this year. So they, they were not messing around, right? This was not something they took seriously. They were still bitter over the Midnight Judges Act, right? They were still bitter about that. So they basically abolished the Supreme Court's term for a year. Does that help your question? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, so any questions on Marbury? Very important case. We'll come back to it very often. Um, a, lot, a, lot, a lot going on there, but only we can do so much. Okay. Anything else on Marbury? All right, let's do the next case, um, which is uh, McCulloch against Maryland. This is probably, people say that Marbury is the most important decision from John Marshall. I don't think that's right. Uh, I think the most important decision from his is McCulloch by, by a long, by a long shot, McCulloch is more important. All right, uh, Fabian, you want to do the facts, please, in McCulloch? Um, I was pretty confused, but um, what I was just awakened by is that the Supreme Court decided that Marbury Uh, just the facts for us, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so, basically, it's about um, whether they, Congress could charter a uh, bank. Okay, very good. So, um, 
But what actually, what gave rise to the dispute, right? What, what, what are the facts? What happened? How did the dispute arise? I think, okay, so they, the Congress was going like bankrupt or there was financial problems and they wanted to see if they could tax or like come up with a way to do that. And so the question became, can they, is it necessary to- yeah. oh, You hear me all correct things. Who, who's McCulloch? Okay, you need to know these things. I think I just like went over the main points rather than the facts. So. Okay, yeah, we need to do facts. <laughs> facts are, uh, j just to give you a preview, the exams, right? The exam question are very fact bound. And what I'll usually do is I'll take a case you studied and change things around a little bit. And if you don't recognize the facts, it, it's not going to work. All right, so Lindsay, uh, what are the facts? Um, the McCulloch? Congress established the Bank of the United States and Maryland, um, McCulloch was a bank teller. Very or good. A cashier. Very good, yeah. The, in, of the Bank of the United States and- In, in which Maryland, branch was it? The Baltimore. Very good, thank you. Branch. Um, and so Maryland had passed a law stating that any bank that wasn't underneath the states, um, if, if it wasn't a, a bank from in Maryland, um, a Maryland bank, sorry, that uh, they imposed new taxes and the only um, out-of-state bank that was in Maryland at the time was the Bank of the United States. And yes. they were trying to see if it was constitutional for a state to tax the Okay, very good. Th thank you so much, Lindsay. Okay. Um, this was a huge issue. Um, the United States, uh, shortly after the ratification of the Constitution in 1789, had a debate, right? Could the United States charter or incorporate or open a bank? This wasn't a private bank. It was a government-run bank, although a lot of the shares were actually held by private citizens. And a debate arose within Congress. Could, could Congress even do this? Um, so you had James Madison, who was in Congress. He was a member of Congress, very influential person. And he argued that Congress did not have the power to charter this bank, okay? He looked at Article One, Section 8, right? Our favorite section of the Constitution. And Article 1, Section 8 lists all the powers that Congress has. Without question, Congress has the power to regulate commerce. They have the power to lay and collect taxes. They can do all these things. But a bank is not regulating commerce. A bank is not laying and collecting taxes. For certain, you can use a bank to collect taxes. And you can use a bank as a means to regulate commerce. But the bank itself is not. So then we go down to the final clause in Article 1, Section 8, which is the necessary and proper clause, right? Um, this is probably the most important provision of Article 1 of the Constitution. And it says that Congress shall have the power to make all laws which be necessary and proper for carrying to execution the foregoing powers. So the question is this. In order to lay and collect taxes, is it necessary to have a bank, right? Can you collect taxes without a bank? Of course you can. So Marshall, I'm sorry, Mar uh, to me M's. Madison says necessary means necessary, strictly necessary, absolutely necessary, right? In other words, you can only pass laws to do what's strictly necessary. I gave you an example yesterday. To have a postal service, do you need horses? Yes. Do you need wagons? Yes. Do you need a mail carrier? Yes. Do you need a bank to, to regulate commerce? No. So you have Madison saying, no good. Um, then you have Jefferson, right? At the time, Jefferson was a Secretary of State. And President Washington asked him for an opinion. Okay? He said, Tom, is this bank constitutional? What should I do? And Jefferson more or less agreed with um, Madison, but took a little, maybe a little more stringent view, right? That necessary means basically absolutely necessary. You couldn't, you couldn't, you know, just 
whatever was helpful. And then Washington asks his other advisor, a young man named Alexander Hamilton, who has become really famous recently with the Broadway musical. Um, Hamilton takes a different perspective. He rejects Jefferson's strict reading. And Hamilton says that necessary uh, has a different meaning. Necessary means needful, requisite, incidental, useful, or conducive. Useful. Well, that's a good word. Useful. Is it useful to have a bank to regulate commerce? Yeah. Is it useful to have a bank to lay taxes? Yeah. Once you substitute the word necessary for useful, you see how the powers expand. And I want to stress this, right? We are not even two years into the republic, and we, are, we already have a big constitutional debate from the people who wrote the damn constitution, right? They didn't even agree back then. They were disagreeing on stuff at the very outset. You have Madison on one side, you have Hamilton on the other. What does Washington do? He signs the bill. He charters the federal bank. Um, we don't know for sure exactly why. Uh, maybe he found Jefferson, I'm sorry, maybe he found Hamilton more persuasive. Or maybe Washington deferred to Congress as if Congress thinks it's okay, then it's okay by me. We don't really know. He, we were a little uncertain about this, but Washington signed it. So that was the first bank of the United States. And eventually the first bank uh, expired and the second bank of the United States opened up. Okay. Who signs the second bank into law? James Madison. Right, so the same person who originally argued that the bank was unconstitutional, then as president, signs into law. There's a huge debate about this. Uh, 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 Madison seems to suggest that uh, the fact that uh, a Congress and multiple generations thought it was valid, uh, uh, affect his opinion. And also Madison suggested that indeed it perhaps was necessary given the present economy uh, in a way that it wasn't in 1789. Okay, so we fast forward and then Madison signs it. But the federal bank becomes unpopular, unpopular. And a lot of states aren't happy with it. So Maryland comes along and says, aha, we have an idea. We want to shut down the federal bank. How? We're going to tax it. We're going to impose a tax on all of these foreign banks, which is basically the federal bank, in our state. And basically every piece of paper, every transaction, we put a tax on. So poor Mr. William McCulloch, he's working for the federal government in this bank. And Maryland says, pay this tax. And McCulloch says, get lost. So then they actually charge McCulloch with a, federal, with a state crime. And he's tried in state court. So the question's this, right? Was the prosecution constitutional? The Maryland, law, the Maryland law says you have to pay the tax, right? He didn't ignore it. He says, I'm not going to follow it. And the reason why is because of the federal law. And then we start with the Supremacy Clause, which I think is the most important part of the entire Constitution, where it says the Constitution and the laws of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land, anything in the laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. In other words, if you have a state law that conflicts with a federal statute, the state law has no effect, right? You follow the higher law. It's not that the state law doesn't exist, it exists, but you follow the higher law. In this case, what do you follow? The federal bank statute. So McCulloch argued that you cannot enforce this tax, this state tax against me. Why? Because the federal bank is supreme. There's a word preempt, P-R-E-E-M-P-T, preempt, or trump, right? Preempt means when a state law is below a federal law. The federal law takes precedence, right? So it's called preempt or preemption, uh, T-I-O-N at the end. You'll see it's spelled differently sometimes. Preempt or preemption. Okay, so the, so the question is this. This wasn't a challenge to the bank's constitutionality straight up, right? It's not like today where 
Maryland goes to court and seeks a nationwide injunction to shut down the Bank of the United States. We didn't have that quite back then, right? That's, that's more modern. Um, instead, McCulloch, as part of his legal defense, said, this prosecution is invalid because the state law is unconstitutional and the federal law is supreme. It trumps, it prevails. Everyone with me? Okay. So uh, I think, who, who's next? Uh, yeah, Chelsea. So walk me through Marshall's analysis, which I think you'll agree is a lot more clear here than it was in, in Marbury. Marbury sort of doing this weird dance, right? Mm -hmm. Here, I think he gets to the point pretty, pretty sharp. Yeah. Um, so he actually defined necessary like Hamilton, mm -hmm. um, except he added PD. Oh, someone read the notes. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, then he said towards the end that um, you have to look at the Constitution more generally mm -hmm. so it would stand for longer periods of time. Yeah. Um, Marshall was writing from the perspective of a Federalist, where he believed he needed a strong central government. And he rejected the Madisonian reading. Because if you take the James Madison approach or the Thomas Jefferson approach, the federal government can't do very much, right? They're really bound by the limits of Article I, Section 8. So instead, he looks to Hamilton. And to be perfectly frank, John Marshall ripped off Hamilton, right? Almost all of, <laughs> almost all of Marshall's great ideas came from Hamilton. I'm not, not I'm only slightly exaggerating, but Marshall took a lot of stuff from Hamilton. For example, Marshall's discussion of uh, judicial review is very similar to Hamilton, the Federalist. Uh, Marshall's discussion of the bank is very similar to Hamilton's defense of it. Um, so he, he got a lot of good stuff from Hamilton. Uh, but then he added a word. He said convenient. Right? He said, um, Congress can enact a law that's, that makes it convenient to execute another power. So in other words, if it's convenient to Congress to have a bank as a means to regulate commerce, hey, go for it. Right? If it's convenient to Congress to have a bank to coin money, go for it. So at this point, though, is there any limit, right? What isn't convenient? Doesn't anything make Congress's job a little easier, right? So we're, we're already seeing, not even, what, 20 years after the Republic's founded, a decision that um, begins to expand federal power. And be very careful. As federal power expands, state power contracts, right? You, you, they can't both be there. Maryland can't occupy a space where there's federal law. So as Congress can do more, the sphere of state power shrinks, right? And that's a necessary, no pun intended, but that's a necessary consequence of Marshall's reading of necessary. Okay, so that's the precise holding. Was your hand up? Well, but, so Washington is he, was, he was a president, right? And then Hamilton, Hamilton was, was the secretary, secretary of the Treasury. Oh, okay, secretary of the Treasury. And then Jefferson was the Secretary of State. Okay. And then Madison at the time was a member of Congress. Okay. That's but Madison later ran for president, right? So after Jefferson served two terms in office as president, Madison served two terms in office. So all these people were basically either president or, or, or you know, high-ranking officials. Yeah. I was just wondering Oh, Washington was in charge. Must be nice to have Washington on your side. Yeah. So wouldn't Hamil Hamilton being the Secretary of the Treasury have vested interest in having a national bank? Oh, he created the bank, right? The entire bank was Hamilton's idea. It was his idea. Um, so it's not surprising that he found it was constitutional. Um, there's, also, there's also a sectional issue, right? Uh, the banks were more popular in the northern states, which involved with commercial uh, trade. The southern states, which were agrarian farmers, um, they they didn't like it. Let me play this clip for you. Did anyone actually ever either see the Hamilton musical or listen to the soundtrack? Yeah. Go. Yeah. So this is this is called the courtroom cabinet battle. I'll play it. It's it's three minutes, but it's very good. Ladies and gentlemen, you could. 
been anywhere in the world tonight, but you're here with us in New York City. Are I'm, you ready for it? Okay, so the setup is this. It, it's, a, it's a musical based on Alexander Hamilton's life, loosely based. And here you have George Washington, the guy playing Washington at least, and he's having a rap battle between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson, and they're actually debating the Bank of the United States. Uh, it's a really cool scene. So just I'll, I'm going to pause it a few times to point stuff out, but you can follow the lyrics on the screen. Oh, hold on. <laughs> this is actually funny. I have to mute the microphone because YouTube, I swear, actually flags my video for piracy when I play this clip in class, and they shut. They actually take my video offline. I, I'm serious. I have to. Okay, I'll turn it off. in the Hamilton show. All right. All right, we're back live. Yeah, every year they take off my videos. Not, not again, if remembered. OK. All right, so the upshot was that Hamilton, Hamilton, Marshall. Marshall held that the federal bank was constitutional. Therefore, by virtue of the supremacy clause, it preempted the state law, and the prosecution had to be dismissed. And then Marshall has some very famous lines. He says, for example, the power to tax is the power to destroy. You probably have heard that line. He didn't invent, I don't think, uh, but he, uh, uh, he uh, made it very popular, right? That if the state can tax a federal institution, then the states can destroy the union, which can't be permissible. He also explains that uh, the Constitution was intended to endure for ages, right? We should not read it so strictly that we must never forget that it is a Constitution that we are expounding or interpreting and that you have to read a constitution differently than you read a statute. It's not so precise and, and, and narrow. OK. All right. Any other questions on McCulloch v. Maryland? Probably the most important Marshall decision. Mar much more important than Marbury, I think, at least. 
Anything on uh, McCulloch? No? Okay. All right, we'll go on to the next case. Um, the next case is uh, Gibbons against Ogden. Um, and this is a case that provided the court's first interpretation of the Commerce Clause. Again, McCulloch v. Maryland is not really a case about the Commerce Clause. It's a case about the Necessary and Proper Clause. Um, Gibbons is a case about the Commerce Clause in particular. What does it mean? What does commerce mean? And what does among mean? I think, Audrey, you're next. Okay. You want to give me the facts, please, in Gibbons against Ogden, 1824? Again, all these are Marshall cases. Here are all, all four of them. So uh, I guess Ogden is the plaintiff and the defendant is Gibbons. And I guess it had something to do with I think it's the other way around. Oh, really? Yeah, I think, I, th I think, I think, oh, oh, you're right, you're right, right. Um, it had something yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, interstate commerce and steamboats, the regulation of steamboats. Okay, very good. So what, what happened? What, what, how, did the, how did the conflict arise? So I guess that Ogden, he... You're right, Ogden was a plaintiff. I, I always invert this one. He yeah. received a license that gave him a right to go operate the steamboats in, I guess, in the... Where were, they, where were these boats it's traveling? Like the waters, so I guess it's interstate. Waters between what? New York. And? And New Jersey. You know, I'm from Staten Island, so here, here's a map of the... Uh, of I've, the been, I've been up there before. Never been to New York? I haven't been to New York. You're not missing much. <laughs> so overrated. Uh, I like Texas much better. All right, so he, here's the situation. And this is in the video if you want to watch. It makes it a little bit clearer. Um, you have... New Jersey, you have Manhattan. Okay, you have these two um, regions. Um, New York granted a monopoly to Ogden that said only he can operate steamboats in New York water, right, in New York Harbor. Gibbons was like, screw that. Who do you think you are? I'm going to operate my, my ferry service from Jersey to New York, okay? New York had given Ogden the monopoly. Ogden goes to court and he asks a court to shut down Gibbons, saying you can't run your boat by New York law, I have a monopoly, right? Audrey, what is then Gibbons' defense? Yes. And so that he had the, under Article 1, Section 8, he had like the exclusive power to... Well, not exclusive. Oh, the implied... What? Implied okay, so, so one at a time. Let's take one at a time. You, 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 you said something good, right? So you said Congress passed a statute that authorized Gibbons to operate the boat. Mm -hmm. If Gibbons had a federal license to operate his boat, what does that mean for the New York law? It conflicts. What do we call that? What's that word I used? I gave it a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. It begins with a P. Oh, uh, preempts. It preempts. Exactly. Gibbons argued that federal law preempted or trumped the state law. This is very similar to McCulloch, right? If, in fact, the federal law was constitutional, then it preempts the state law to the contrary. In other words, New York cannot prohibit something that federal law expressly permits. Let me say that again. New York cannot criminalize an act that federal law permits. Everyone understand that point? So again, this case comes down to a question. Did Congress have the power to regulate boat traffic between the states? It's very similar to McCulloch. In McCulloch, the question was, did Congress have the power to regulate and to create the bank? Here, the question is, did Congress have the power, did Congress have the power to regulate boats 
traveling between New York and New Jersey. All right, sounds good. Okay, so Tyler, let's start with this question, right? What is commerce? <laughs> they answered the question, uh, you know, do they have the power to regulate, you know, this, this commerce? Yes, and then some. No, no, no. With what is com you No, know, we get, okay, okay. First off, how does Ogden, right, the New York monopolist, understand commerce? Again, was, the New York guy yeah. wants to say this federal law is unconstitutional, right? Ogden says this federal law is unconstitutional. How does he define commerce? As what he was specifically privileged to do with his boat in the specified New York, New Jersey waters, as, as not amongst multiple states. Well, we're not getting to the states yet. Let's just, you're going to the next part. Be very simple. What is the more, the more narrow definition of commerce? Business. Is that what you're making this up? Where are you getting this from? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was his, his conduct of his business as licensed. So, Faven, what's the, what's the word that, or the, what's the words that a more narrow definition of commerce? It's, it's in the cases. Um, traffic. Yeah. Traffic of what? Traffic of what? Well, that, that's one definition. Faven, you're next. You're on call. Between states? But no, not to the between, just commerce by itself. What does it include? It's just moving stuff around? I mean, business? Or like More precise. I'm looking for a specific act. Is it just moving stuff from point A to point B? What, what's the narrow definition of commerce that Ogden wanted? Including money? Good. And what do you do with money? Buying and selling. There it is. Thank you. Right? Ogden offered a narrow definition of commerce. He said commerce means buying and selling. Right? He argued, Ogden, that merely operating a boat to transport people from A to B is not commerce. Yeah, Audrey. We're going to get to the among, right? You, you're, again, there are different words here. There's commerce and among the yeah. several states. I'm just doing commerce first. We'll get to among in a couple minutes. All right? OK, this one you didn't do, right? I, I may be able to do it. I think so. Oh, I appreciate the willingness. All right. What's the broader definition then of commerce if it's not just buying? What else could commerce include? Um, it says the exchange of goods, labor, transportation, intelligence, care, and various mediums of exchange. Very good. Marshall adopts a broader understanding of commerce. He says it's a word that whenever I say people giggle, intercourse. Right? That, that, that doesn't mean sex. That's how I guess it's used today. But it means things going between, which is why we use that word, right? It describes the commercial intercourse between nations and parts of a nation, the exchange. It doesn't have to involve buying and selling, right? Do you see, again, how Marshall is using words that expand the scope of the Constitution? He said that the word necessary means convenient, right? Here he says, commerce means intercourt, inter intercourt, intercourse, exchange. The second you change commerce to intercourse, that can mean anything, moving people, right, moving goods. So here the court adopts a very broad understanding of the word commerce. And to this day, the word commerce has more or less stayed the same, right? The court hasn't really expanded the meaning of commerce. It refers to intercourse, exchange. OK, so far so good, guys? But then the next part of the opinion is among, which all of you want to talk about, right? Let's go back to our map. The case involves moving stuff from New York to New Jersey back and forth. Now, I'm assuming you've all been on a boat, right? 
How do boats work? They leave one harbor, they're in the open sea, and they pull into another harbor and they dock. Where do Congress's powers begin and end? Can they only regulate the boat in the open waters? What about when the boat actually docks? Right? When the boat docks at, at shore in New York Harbor, is that among the states or is that in one state? So Chelsea, how does, how does Marshall handle this issue, right? Because obviously boats go into a harbor, maybe they go up a river, right? What if you start from New Jersey and you go up the Hudson River all the way into New York City? Um, you get the a more broader term, like a yeah. Intermingled. Intermingled. Very good, yeah. Intermingled with, right? Right? He uses this word. This is the video. I'm still figuring out how to use this. I'm not quite sure yet. But, you know, the Constitution says you can regulate commerce among the several states. And he uses the word intermingled with. And the Constitution says you can regulate commerce. He uses the word intercourse. And you see how that broadens the scope, right? Intermingled means not between, but even within a single state, right? So if a boat goes from New Jersey Harbor, pulls into New York Harbor and docks, that's still commerce among the several states. This is interstate commerce as it's known, even though it's not between states, it's within one state. Now again, where's the limit? I will always ask you this question, what is the limiting principle, right? Does this mean that Congress can regulate anything, right? A boat starts in New Jersey, goes into New York, and travels over land for 100 miles? What is outside the scope of Congress's powers? So Audrey, can Congress can regulate anything, any sort of commerce anywhere? Yes. What sort of commerce can Congress not regulate? Marshall's a phrase. I'm, I'm like wanting to go back to necessary property. Well, no, we're, we're not doing necessary and proper here. We're, we're just commerce here. This is not a necessary and proper case. Rare. Most of them are also, but this case is only commerce clause. So the, you're saying the limit? What's the limit, right? When, what, what sort of stuff can Congress not regulate? What's reserved to the states? You're, but I'm talking about commerce, right? You know, imagine you transport goods from New Jersey to New York, uh, then you put those goods in a wagon and you take them inland, you sell them at a market, and then someone, you know, can Congress then regulate that market inland? What's the phrase used? Say it again. Bingo. There you go. Marshall says that states cannot. I'm sorry, Congress cannot regulate exclusively internal commerce, right? Exclusively internal Congress, okay? Exclusively internal Congress is a matter for the state itself. This is an important part. Marshall recognizes that there is a limit, that Congress has to have a limit on their powers. He says, this is a very important quote, the enumeration presupposes something not enumerated. What does that mean? The fact that some powers are listed that are enumerated in Article 1, Section 8 means other powers are not listed. This is the flows from the Tenth Amendment, right? It says the power is not delegated to the United States are reserved to the states, right? If a power is not listed, the states have it. And Marshall reaffirms this principle. So he broadly reads the scope of commerce, and he broadly reads what it means to be among the states, but he still limits it to saying that there's some stuff Congress can't do. That Congress does not have a general police power. Does anyone know what a police power is? What's that? The states. The states what? To regulate what? The government. Ugh, close. Anyone else? Yeah. Health, safety, and welfare. 
Very good, yeah. Generally, the health, safety, welfare, and public morals, right? It's called the police power, the state's ability to regulate. Uh, the state can regulate just about anything, right? They don't have, the Texas is not limited to what powers are enumerated. They can re regulate anything. Congress is limited to enumerated powers. So we ask, does Congress have this power, right? Where's the thing I'll show you? Right, we ask, does Congress have this power? If the answer is yes, then the states lack it. But if Congress does not have a power, who has it? The states. And what Marshall's saying is that the states can regulate internal commerce, or strictly internal, but commerce that's intermingled is for the federal government. Therefore, the federal law that, that Gibbons relied on was constitutional. The New York monopoly for Ogden was preempted, and was unconstitutional, and Gibbons could run his boat. Yeah. Going on a, a little tangent, but to better understand, what would be an example of an exclusively internal commerce? Oh, we'll get there, my friend. Um, the Supreme Court wouldn't really come back this issue until the 19... <sighs> no, actually, you know what? I think the reading for tomorrow will cover some of it. Yeah, the reading for tomorrow will cover some of it. For example, can Congress prohibit the sale of oil in a state? Do the reading for tomorrow, you'll see. Peel the book off. All right. Any other questions on McCulloch? Yes, sir. sir I'm sorry, not McCulloch, Gibbons. I, I like people losing track. Referring to duties, um, you said that there was a phrase in there about duties being will be conceded. Does that talk about concurrent, is that concurrent taxes? The state can tax imports yes. and exports? So this is actually a, a, an actually a difficult question, right? McCulloch says the power to tax is the power to destroy. OK. Can a state not place a tax on the employees of the federal government? Right, so let's say you're a federal employee and you're living in Texas. Could they then exempt you from the payroll tax, of state, state payroll taxes? Or property tax. Let's say you have a post office in Houston and Houston assesses a property tax. Is the federal government then not allowed to, or, or does the federal government exempt it from paying a property tax? Um, this issue actually came up quite a bit. I think what Marshall's getting at is, well, you can have sort of general taxes, but not a tax targeted to destroy the federal institutions. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, because if, if you're a federal employee living in a state, I'm sorry you have to pay federal taxes, right? You're not excused from the, from the state tax. You have to pay everything. Um, but if, say, for example, a state passes a tax only on a federal institution, I think that tax will be a problem. But I think Tyler raises the issue of concurrent jurisdiction, right? What happens when both the states and the feds can tax the same entity? I think this is what Marshall is sort of getting, because he knows this will be a problem. Because if Marshall says you can't, states can't tax at all, then that makes a lot of uh, uh, federal institutions uh, outside the law. But very good question. OK, other questions on Gibbons? Is that a question? Yeah, I have a lot. I mean, I have a lot of questions. You can ask whatever you want. We have four people, like six people here. You can ask whatever you want. Um, but from what I, for the judicial review part, from what I'm getting at, is that um, the Supreme Court has said that the judicial review is limited to what's in the Constitution. Is that and something? All right, so I mean, I think, I yeah, I think, question. no, Audrey asked a very good question, right? Um, so this is part of the, I'm still figuring out how to use these videos effectively. I'm not quite sure, but I'm going to do it a little guinea pig style. Um, uh, the, pa this, the, the court has not been consistent in how it's interpreted implied powers, the necessary and proper clause. It's changed over 200 years. And uh, I know it's hard to see, but this is John Marshall, right? So McCulloch and Gibbons are here, right? So this is Washington, the first bank, and this is McCulloch. So you think this is bad? It gets much higher, right? As these bars go up, it's a broader reading of applied power, so they go very high. You read Prig in class tomorrow, that was really high. And then the Chase Court, they go lower, and then it goes higher, and then it goes lower, then it goes lower, then it goes higher and higher and higher. So there's been this perpetual um, enlargement 
of the scope of federal power since the time of Washington. And occasionally it goes back down, but usually it goes back up. And I think this is due in large part to how the judges appointed in a given time view implied powers. Um, Congress loves this, right? Because as these bars go up, Congress gets more powers. But as these bars go up, the states and the people ultimately have uh, less power by virtue of the 10th Amendment. Does that answer your question a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this timeline's in your book. Um, we have a PDF version of it, which I'm not crazy about, but um, I'll show it here. It, it, it's good for a book. It doesn't look as good for the, uh, in, in a, on the screen, right? So you have the Marshall Court with McCulloch and Gibbons. You have the Tawny Court, and it jumps out over here. You know, the Chase Court gets smaller, and then it goes really big. You know, the 1800s, then the New Deal, and the 1960s, then the 2000s, and the 2012, right? So it's a cycle based on going really big, then pulling back, then going really big again. Interpreting power to Congress. Yeah. Different yeah. Yeah. The Constitution hasn't changed, right? The Commerce Clause has been exactly the same for 230 years, right? Has not changed a little bit. What's changed has been the interpretation of it. I think that was your point earlier, right? The Constitution hasn't changed. It's pretty fixed. But what's changed has been the interpretation by the courts of the Constitution. And who checks the courts? No one really. Uh, law professors who tweet about them, they don't like that very much. <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> And there are law clerks who follow people on Twitter. Okay. There was actually a good story, an article published, uh, or a draft article put out today, where uh, these two law professors um, followed on Twitter uh, Supreme Court law clerks. And even though while they were clerking, they didn't tweet, they started following people. And they tracked who they were following at any given point in time while they were clerking. And uh, you know, they <laughs> when I when I was clerking, one of my conditions of employment was I had to shut down my blog for a year. I had to put the entire thing behind a behind a, a password, and I had to stop tweeting for a year. This is in 2011, so it was very different. Uh, but that was one of my conditions to work for a judge for a year, and I, I did it. I wasn't happy about it, but I did it. I'm sacrificed. Okay. Uh, anything else on Gibbons? No, I think I got everything I want. Any other questions on Gibbons? Anything? Okay. All right, moving very, uh, very good pace. Um, let's go into the last case, which is Barron against Baltimore. Um, I'm often very critical of Chief Justice Marshall because I think his reasoning is often very slippery. Uh, but I think in Barron, he gets it exactly right. And dare I say, his analysis is very sharp in Barron. Um, I mean, when Marshall wants to be clear, he's clear as day. When he wants to sort of just, he does that, right? He sort of just flubs up in the air, hopes it sticks. But in Barron, man, it, it's tight. There's no, you know, usually you read a case from the 1700s and it, it sucks, right? You can't understand a word of it. Think of like property and torts, right? It's like, what are they saying? Marshall was a good writer. He was sharp when he wanted to be, but when he didn't, it was, it was a, I have to do more work. So let's talk about Barron against Baltimore. I think, Tyler, are you next? Okay, you want to give me the facts with some Barron against Baltimore? It was an uh, uh, individual who brought a cause of action uh, against the mayor and city council of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. they, had, they had intentionally diverted a uh, natural course of water, um, one of the rivers, that interfered with his, uh, his warmth, his business, his, Good. his commerce. Uh, and he was the plaintiff was citing Article 5, uh, takings clause. Uh, uh, Fifth Amendment, not Article 5, Fifth Amendment. Forgive me, yeah. yeah. Fifth Amendment, takings clause. Very good. Uh, as how he saw as an entitlement to just compensation uh, for the damage done, for his economic uh, loss that he experienced at, at, as a result of City of Baltimore, Maryland's assembly, et cetera. Mm. And uh, upon review, the discussion of police power Marshall's opinion made very clear that that was something that was to be decided by the states and utilizing their federal uh, governing document, a, fed a federal provision intended for federal use solely was not applicable to an individual in a state-specific case. Okay, very good. Um, 
So let's do some background first. I think I mentioned this in class uh, yesterday. Um, the Constitution was written in 1787, and then there was a two-year process by which the states approved or ratified it. Um, a lot of the states who ultimately approved the Constitution had an objection. What was their objection? That the Constitution um, lacked the Bill of Rights. That the Constitution didn't put limits on the power of this new government. For example, protection of free speech, uh, freedom of religion, right to bear arms, etc. cetera. Um, so in 1789, the first Congress proposed uh, 12 amendments to the Constitution, uh, 10 of which were actually ratified at that time. Um, but then a debate arose in Barron. Did the Bill of Rights, the, or they, it wasn't called at the time, but did the first eight amendments limit federal power, limit Congress's power? Or did the Bill of Rights also limit the state's power? Uh, so let's start with the First Amendment, right? It says in the very first word, Congress. Congress should make no law respecting an establishment of religion. There's no doubt, right? That's easy. That law limits Congress's powers, right? It says nothing about the states. It's about Congress. Okay, but now let's look at the Fifth Amendment, what's now called the Takings Clause. <clears throat> it says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Now, that provision isn't so clear. It doesn't say Congress, it doesn't say the states. It just says that private property cannot be taken. Taken by whom, right? This is why when you're doing legal writing, avoid the passive voice. You know what the passive voice is, right? Who's the actor? Who's taking, state or feds? We don't know. Um, I hate the passive voice. I hate it because it lets you be lazy, it lets you avoid the subject, right? You know, the best line is mistakes were made. Who made those mistakes, right? Um, so the text of the, of the Fifth Amendment isn't very helpful. So here we have John Barron, right? He has a harbor in Baltimore. I'm sorry, he has, he has a wharf, which is basically a dock in the Baltimore Harbor. And the city basically changes the water flows and dumps all this earth and sand on his harbor. The water becomes shallow and shuts down his business. So then he files suit against the city and the mayor for violating the takings clause. Now, just pause for one second. Have you taken property too yet? Okay, so you'll take this later. Do they take his property? Or do they reduce the value of the property? There's an entire doctrine of law which you'll study in property too called regulatory takings. Regulatory takings. And the idea is if the government reduces the value of your property too much, they've actually taken it. Even if you get to keep it, right? They say, uh, you can't build anything on your land, but you can sit there with a tent, right? There's a case like that. Have they taken your property? Okay, but we'll put that aside for now. This isn't property, this is common law. You might have me for property too also. I, they haven't given us our full schedule. It drives me nuts. Isn't it insane? I don't know my schedules. You think you guys, I have no idea what I'm teaching. It's, in, it's, it's, it's infuriating. I don't know what I'm teaching. It drives me nuts. Like, I can't prepare anything. I can't get ready. I have no idea what my schedule is. Uh, they try to get to us in May. Uh, whatever. I mean, professors, we have a lot of freedom except for our schedule. Like, we can do anything we want, but their schedule we have no control over. Zero. None. We have. Y you can make requests, which I don't think are ever. They, they think of it this way, right? There are like 50 professors, and they all want to teach, you know, in the day, be home by 5, right? But they can't do that for everyone, so here I am. Uh, with you all four nights a week. So I enjoy it though. I think I, I love teaching, it doesn't matter. Okay. So Marshall then rejects John Barron's claim. And he says the Bill of Rights limits only federal power. And here the Chief Justice uses what I think are um, pretty good textual arguments, right? It's based on the structure of the Constitution. And so let's just walk through this. We have Article 1, Section 9. Um, Article 1, Section 9 limits the federal government's powers. And you can go through it in your Constitution. And it says, for example, that no bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. Okay? 
no bill of attainder of ex post facto law shall be passed. Again, it's silent who it applies to. All right, it doesn't say Congress can't pass an ex post facto law, it's just it shall not be passed. Again, here's our beloved passive voice. But Marshall says, we know what that means. In the Constitution, this provision of Section 9 limits federal power. Okay? Scroll down, or actually, page. You know, no, there was no scrolling back then, right? We have Article 1, Section 10, which begins, no state shall. Okay, so we know this about states. And states can't pass bills of attainder or ex post facto laws. So wait a minute, Marshall says. We have a specific provision to limit state power. And this other provision, which doesn't say federal, limits federal power. The presumption is, unless the state is clearly indicated, Unless the Constitution specifically says the states are limited, then we presume only federal power is limited. I think it makes sense, right? And Marshall backs us up with history, right? The states have the power to provide greater protections of freedom. How? State constitutions. Never forget there's a US Constitution and there's a Texas Constitution, and they're not the same thing. And the Texas Constitution gives you a heck of a lot more rights than does a federal constitution. You will all be lawyers in a couple of years, God willing. If you're litigating a case, bring claims from the state constitution also, right? Federal law is not supreme. It is, but not really, right? The states, as a, as a judge Jeff Sutton says, there are 51 imperfect solutions, right? There are 51 constitutions, and each of them have their own approach to things. So never forget the state uh, constitutions, right? Marshall writes, if the states want to provide additional safeguards to liberty, the remedy was in their own hands. Okay. Uh, Marshall also makes a historical claim. He explains that the Bill of Rights was added out of a fear. A fear that the federal government would be too strong. There's no fear about the states being too strong. There's a fear about the feds. So as a result, there's no argument that the federal government, I'm sorry, that the state governments are constrained by the first eight amendments. Uh, so any questions then about Barron? Yes, sir. I, I just had a, is the, the way that they ended, the, uh, the, that they had no jurisdiction, is that truly an accurate statement? In Barron? Correct. Oh, that's a good question. I never thought of that. So, well, let me, let, me, let me give you an example, right? Let's say you have a statute of limitations, an easy example, right? And let's say that the statute of limitations expired last year and you bring a lawsuit. Um, the defendant moves to dismiss because the statute of limitations ran. Would you say that there's a lack of jurisdiction in that case? Lack of the ability to, no, I wouldn't. I mean, it's, they can hear things on appeal. I think it's still. But, but can a court hear a claim no. that's barred by the statute of limitations? Can they do anything? Can they no. hold a trial, summary judgment, anything? So does that court lack jurisdiction? It would. Yeah, I, th I think it would. I, I never quite thought of it the way you asked, but I think, I think it would. So let's use this as an example, right? Statute of limitation means you can bring this loss within five years. If you wait six years, you're, you're, you're SOL. You're, you're, you're out of luck, as they say. Um, let's say you sue, under the, you sue under the wrong provision of the Constitution, right? Let's say you're an idiot lawyer. You're not, right? But let's say you mean to sue under the First Amendment, and your caption, you actually write Second Amendment. You just write the, the wrong thing. Do you have a cause of action? Do you have anything to sue on? You, you, you sued the wrong provision of law. Does the court even have jurisdiction? Okay, let me try one more time. You know, federal courts have, uh, I think this was actually brought in state court, if I remember correctly, but I'll just use a, a federal court example. Federal courts have jurisdiction for cases arising under federal law, right? Correct. Does the Fifth Amendment, as applied to the states, arise under federal law? No. I, I think it's a, you know, I never thought of it quite that way, but I think the, when you sue under the wrong provision of constitutional law, 
the court lacks jurisdiction. He could sue under a state constitution, that would have been valid, but he sued under the federal constitution. Yeah, I, just, I was hung up on yeah, it's the good. appellate aspect. They can hear any and all appeals. Well, well, the... Okay, so I, I see your question, right? But this is more of, a civ, uh, more of a civ pro question, right? Let's say the trial court finds there's no jurisdiction, right? Can you appeal that? Yes, That's right? True. Because maybe the trial court's wrong. And so the Supreme Court basically takes the case for the sole purpose of deciding there's no jurisdiction. It's like a limited appearance type thing, right? Where you're just there for the purpose of contesting jurisdiction, nothing else. Giving you bad flashbacks, Civ Pro? A little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm flashing back to my one L year also. Right? You know, in other words, right? So let's say someone sues you in the wrong form, right? You can make a limited appearance for the sole purpose of contesting jurisdiction. Say, look, there's no personal jurisdiction here. I'm not even consenting to the merits, but I'm the wrong person. Because if you don't show up, you get default judgment against you, and that, that sucks. Yeah, like I, I, had a, I had a case over the summer where, I, where my client was sued in New Jersey. He's a Texas business, and, and I, had a, I told the judge, like, judge, I'm only here for purposes of contesting jurisdiction. I do not consent to this court's jurisdiction. I mean, you have to register that on the record, uh, but ultimately the, the court ruled bizarre, complicated case, but th that, that would be the right way. In this case, the court's simply saying not there's a lack of personal jurisdiction, there's a lack of subject matter jurisdiction because this provision of law doesn't apply to the state of Maryland, so Maryland can get the case dismissed. Does that tell us that clear for your question a little bit? It does, yes, sir. Okay. I say, it seemed like that was, he said that essentially the same thing in mm -hmm. this case and the Margaret case. Uh, very yeah, very, yeah, 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 but he went backwards though, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So going back to Margaret and Madison, because how you mentioned that uh, President Madison never even showed up. Never showed up. Did he make an appearance? So in no. theory, there could have been a default judgment against him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in fact, one of the reasons why I go back and forth on whether uh, Margaret was correctly decided, think of it this way, right? If the other side, the defendant, doesn't brief a case, can the judge then consider arguments that were not briefed? In other words, this is a, a friend of mine who always raises this argument. He drives me nuts. Um, he says, Marshall picked the best argument available for him. In other words, the only arguments he had before him were in this limited scope. That's the argument he picked. I go back and forth. I, I, if you watch my videos from last year, I may say something completely opposite of what I said this year. I'll give you a promise. I will not con contradict myself in a given class but I make no promises of consistency for last year. I always change my mind. I teach this class you know, every semester just about, and I always think things differently. Whatever the world's going on, maybe my mood changes, but I always see things uh, in a different fashion. So I can't always give you a right answer, but I go back and forth in the Marlboro. You say, it's wrong, and I'm like, maybe it's right. But I, I feel like it yeah. has to do with the fact that just, Chief Justice Marshall, that I've read about him, that he basically was really good at orating, but actually interpreting the law. He would, he would come up with the rulings, and yet other justices like That's not right at all. No. Nope. He wrote them all himself. Okay. He, was a, he was a prodigious writer. He wrote hundreds of pages by himself. He was a remarkable human being. Um, I mean, he, he wrote these huge biographies of George Washington. He was like a, you know, he was like a Renaissance man of the highest order. He, uh, you know, uh, in fact, one of his biggest accomplishments on the court was to get the courts to write uh, uh, opinions of the court. Um, before Marshall, there was a practice in the Supreme Court called seriatim. S-E-R-I-A-T-I-M, seriatim. What did that mean? Each justice would write a separate opinion. So if there were five justices, you have five separate opinions. And it was up to the lawyers to figure out what the majority was, what the holding was. Can you imagine that? Reading five separate opinions, trying to figure out what the most narrow holding was? It was insane. Marshall made it his calling to unite the court to have a single majority opinion, which he would usually write. And all the justices would then join him. There were very few dissents in the Marshall Court because he kept everyone on the same page. He was a very good diplomat in that regard. Uh, at the time, Washington, D.C. was a bit of a swamp, literally, uh, and people didn't really have p places to live. Uh, most of the justices kept their homes back in their home states, and they would come to D.C. for the sitting, then they'd go back to their homes. Uh, so during the year, they would live in these boarding houses, these basically hotels, and all the justices would live in the same hotel, and they would always talk about cases over dinner. Uh, when they were socializing. It was a funny story. Um, uh, John Marshall loved to drink wine, a type called Madeira, a type of wine. 
And the story goes like this. Uh, they would only drink uh, Madeira when it was raining out. You know, you're dark and dreary, right? But let's say it was a beautiful sunny day. Marsh would go somewhere over our jurisdiction from coast to coast, it's raining, so let's drink. <laughs> and uh, he would always use that story to bring people together. He was a remarkable person. I think it's, he served as Chief Justice for maybe 33, 34 years, check me on the math. Uh, but uh, he had a stunning amount of work. And his opinions are read to this day. We're st you're, you're still reading John Marshall opinions 200 and something years later, uh, which is stunning. Um, remarkable character, uh, the people in the founding era. They, 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 at young ages, basically at you know my age, these people were already like on the Supreme Court, right? Uh, it's pretty cool. Okay. So any other questions on the holding in Barron v. Baltimore? Um, so the rule in Barron would stay the same for almost four decades. That the federal government, I'm sorry, the Bill of Rights, the first eight amendments, do not limit state power. Um, as a result, the states were free, free is a bad word, the states had the power to restrict the rights of their people in any way they wished. Right? There were no real limits on what the states could do to their people. That would change following the Civil War. After the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was ratified. And many of the drafters of the 14th Amendment understood this provision to change Barron. Right? They were basically using a constitutional amendment to overrule Barron. And the idea was now the first eight amendments, or at least most of them, would apply to the states. That is, that the Bill of Rights would limit state power as well. So now if the state takes your property, they are violating the Fifth Amendment, and then you can go to court and have jurisdiction to sue them for violating the Fifth Amendment and the, the takings clause. That's the modern law. Uh, it's what's known as the incorporation doctrine, that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment incorporates or extends the provisions of the Bill of Rights to the states. So today, uh, virtually every provision in the Bill of Rights, with a few exceptions, um, applies equally to the state governments and the federal government. So for example, uh, the right to a civil jury trial, the Seventh Amendment, uh, that does not apply in the states. Um, the right of having a grand jury indictment, that to be charged with a crime of a grand jury, that does not apply to the states. The states can do it voluntarily, but not as a matter of constitutional law. Okay, so any questions on uh, McCulloch, Gibbons, Marbury, or, or Barron? Okay. Um, in class tomorrow, we will continue our discussion of enumerated powers. Uh, and we'll do a couple important eras, right? Um, let me give you a little summary of how the final exam is going to work, and this will help explain this class. Um, in most cases, uh, you don't really care how the law developed, right? You care, here's what the law is today, here's what the restatement second says, I'm done. Um, this class is a little bit different. It's as much law as it is history. And you have to understand how cases were decided at a particular point in time, right? I'll go back to this uh, 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 diagram I had, I had here a minute ago. Um, at various points in time, the court has interpreted the scope of implied powers differently. Today we did the Marshall Court. Tomorrow we'll do the court under Chief Justice Taney, the court under Chief Justice Chase. All right, here's Taney, here's Chase, and in the progressive era, the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, and at each juncture, the court's approach to implied powers changes. You will need to know how these cases evolved over the past 200 years. And here's how I'm going to test you on it. Uh, the final exam has two questions. One question is set in the present, the year 2019, so whatever current law is. And the second question will be set in the past, the year's 1868, the year's 1824, the year's 1920. And you cannot cite any cases that occurred after that year. You basically freeze yourself in time to ask, how would the Marshall Court decide this case? How would the Chase Court decide this case? How would the New Deal Court decide this case? 
Um, I do this to force you to understand how doctrine develops. You can't start at the end point. You have to know at each juncture, what was the law here? What was the law there? What was the law there? So as you keep your notes, be sure you keep a list of the cases and the years in which they were decided. Um, also, as you keep your notes, I want you to keep track of the justices. Their identities do matter. Their names matter. If they write a dissent, make sure you read the dissent. The dissents are often just as important as the majority opinion. Um, I don't want to scare you, but since it's a compressed semester, you have to start thinking about this earlier. Uh, take a look at the syllabus. I linked to a bunch of old exams, see what they look like. Um, again, the exams are completely open book. Will not help with your notes. If you're looking at your notes in the exam, you'll run out of time. Um, it's essay question, no multiple choice. One essay in the present, one essay in the past. I hate, I hate multiple choice, I don't do well on them. Um, you have a word limit, 1,000 word max. Don't go over that, I won't read it. It's designed to keep everyone on the same page. Okay? Um, but next class for tomorrow, we're going to do the Tawny Court with Prigvy, Pennsylvania. That case involves a Fugitive Slave Act. We'll do from the Chase Court, United States versus DeWitt, which involved the oil case I mentioned before. Uh, Hepburn v. Griswold and Knox v. Lee involves paper money. And then finally, we'll do cases in the progressive era. Uh, E.C. Knight is the federal government's power to regulate monopolies. Uh, Champion v. Ames is the federal government's power to prevent lottery tickets. And Hammer versus Dagenhart is the federal government's power to regulate child labor. Okay. Any other questions? Anything else? I'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place. <laughs>